Great, wonderful day. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I, th I think you can hear me clearly, right? Right, yes. Yes, yes. yes. great, yeah. And welcome to today. go through this panel. So before that, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm currently the Executive Director of Social Enterprise Research Academy, which is a cross-sectoral platform to advocate sustainability and social caring responsibility as well through two key assessment programs. So one is called the Social Caring Pledge Award Scheme, and the other one is called the Fellowship Qualification Assessment Scheme that nominates and corporates and leaders to to raise their social responsibility consciousness and to acknowledge their social contributions to join and to demonstrate their caring aspirations. So, so far we have more than 500 corporations, uh, big or listed companies, small, medium-sized corporates also joining the programs. We have been regularly hosting symposiums such as Horasis and to facilitate discussions among business leaders, policymakers, investors, and communities. So today we're very honored to have Frank invitation to join Run the World and Horasis meeting in USA. So now uh, we've realized that the worst of the pandemic actually appears to be like over in some parts of the world with the provision of the vaccine. But have we ever imagined what is the biggest risk in the post-COVID world? So today we're we're going to discuss the two huge sets of problems that are still getting worse, which are the wealth concentration and also the environmental issues. And the biggest risk is to actually see that everyone will just go back to normal, as we know that, and that we don't learn from the crisis and there will be no impact on the future developments if we, if we just go back to normal without learning from the crisis. So for me, the most uplifting thing and the takeaway from the COVID-19 crisis is that we recognize that the old normal was not actually good enough and that there are actually opportunities from the crisis to create a different way of living in our world. So I would say that COVID is actually once in a lifetime opportunity, at least for me at my age at the moment, to tap into the potential and social human capital and our power of social caring spirit is to bring the future that we want. And the crisis showed us that the people and the institutions can make massive adjustments in just in our life in just overnight. And that's in crisis we can work together to help each other. So today we have four distinguished four key leaders across the society, across business, across industry, and across government joining to discuss in what ways we can recover and to bring a wiser, kinder, and greener future. The future business landscape will be shaped by how we respond to today's social and environmental challenges from developing CSR policies. Um, let us begin with our first speaker of today, Mr. Gustavo Belanga, who is the honorary chairman of Academy, and he was the president of Global Compact Network Mexico from 2010 to 2016. He was also the Senior Vice President of Social Responsibility at Mexico Talks Restaurants Group. He's passionate about employing entrepreneurship to battle poverty, empower people, and to fight child labor. He has successfully incorporated 13 out of 17 global goals, which is really an accomplishment, I think, through his company supply chain to make his vision a reality. Our Academy is lucky to have Mr. Berlanga advises in the past. Thank you so much, Mr. Berlanga. And also based on the UN Global Compact, our Academy established the Global Social Caring Pledge Scheme with the six principles clearly laid out the initiative for sustainable business practices in Hong Kong. So Mr. Berlanga, could you share with us more about your views on what's the future developments of CSR in the post-COVID world? And what is the required social mindset for the new normal? Uh, are you going to show us with some PowerPoints, as I remember, or are you going to just share with us? Yes, please feel free. I am. I am go only going to going to share, Bonnie. Thank you very much for the introduction. 
And by, by the way, Bonnie, happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And it's an honor to share the, the panel with Luigi, Eddie, Lucy, and, and you, Bonnie. And, uh, and okay, and, and now I start, no? Uh, COVID-19 has been like a wake-up call in many ways. Mm. No, uh, one of the learnings is that how fragile we are as human beings. And, and, and it's very important to understand this. We, we want to believe before the, before the COVID that we have everything under, under control. But, but that, that's not true. And, and also, the, we, are, we are suffering as, as humans, but also all the biodiversity in the planet is suffering because of us and, and, our, and our behavior. So we have three main issues. One on the economic side, that is how to deal with this short-term crisis and long-term recession. Sure. Then we have to focus also on the environmental with all this climate change issue and biodiversity loss. And we, we were going to be here for one hour. Well, in one hour, four different species are going to disappear in this next hour in a plant or, a, or an animal. We, so this uh, diversity loss is a huge issue for, for, for the planet. And then we have all this social issue that millions of people are suffering because lack of food, education, health, and, and others. So we are living in a very, very challenging way. And, and may, many people think about the post-COVID area. Uh, I, I, there's no such a thing of post-COVID because COVID is going to stay here for a long time. And so we have to live with it uh, in, in the long term. So the question is, how can we achieve a better version of ourselves as humans and, and, a, and a better society with uh, the, the corporations and companies or, or, the, or the institutions we work for? There are two main visions in the world. You have this Western world vision that is about the individual, human rights, freedom, independence. So I am the important one as a person in the Western vision. But also we have this community vision uh, that, 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 that is, um, is practiced in, in African cultures, look at the South African uh, solo culture in, in 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 the bottom of Africa, and 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 if you remember this Ubuntu uh, vision that tells, I am because we are, and solidarity is important thing in the community. So I think we need both. We need our freedom, of course, but we we want we have to think as humans in a solidarity way. So I, I, I suggest, and I have three minutes left, five, five, five things that we can have a better version of ourselves uh, in, in, in this new area. First, prioritize what is really important. Really important for you and for the humanity and for the planet. Then have this long-term vision. Uh, I, I was uh, 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 lecturing uh, a class for for uh, business people here in Mexico, and and, and I asked the the uh, audience, when was the last time that, that you took a decision thinking about the people who hasn't been born yet? Mm. So we need this long term vision for 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 making the change for good. That that's the number two, the three is focus on the importance of health and wellness. And on three main areas, we as persons, we as a society, and we as a member of, 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 of we are one of many species on the planet. So first of us, and also in the first place, all the community and then the planet. The fourth one, and I am about to finish, 
is never stop learning. We have been, we have, have had many learnings uh, because of this of this pandemic, and there are many things to to learn how to build better companies in a sustainable way. And and the last but not least thing that we live in a global community that needs us. You, Bonnie, you are in Hong Kong, and and and, and, and Luigi is is in 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 Spain, but he's yeah. from Italy. And, and then Eddie, Eddie is also in Hong Kong, and Lucy is in, in Panama, and I am in Mexico, but we, we, but we are part of a global community. And, and, and we have to think that way, that everything that we do affects the other. And, um, okay, I have 30 seconds left, but I'm, I am going to stop just to, to hear what all my colleagues uh, have to say that. It's going to be very, very important. Thank you, Bonnie, for the invitation again. And again, happy birthday. Thank you so much, Mr. Tulanga. <laughs> so um, it's well, wonderful to, to, to actually come across again, like even though for a year that we didn't travel and where we are very honored to have uh, you, Mr. Tulanga, to speak with us today. And so let me introduce our second speaker, Mr. Eddie Ng to share with us on his view on how the concept of social responsibility plays amidst such a time of crisis, and despite the negative impacts of COVID-19 has harmed to society. Like, um, I would like to introduce Mr. Eddie Ng as a retired secretary for education for Hong Kong government in 2012 to 2017 during his service, and has been an education and human resources professional for 15 years. He was the chairman of Human Capital Management Consulting Limited, senior HR executive for corporations like Macquarie Security, Asia, JP Morgan Chase, Guardian Fleming Holdings, AT&T, Bank, Motorola, and Asia Pacific region. And on his the social services side, he was the chairman of Hong Kong Information and Assessment Authority, deputy chairman of Hong Kong Education University and a visiting professor on MBA and MSW for many universities. Our academy is very honored to have Mr. Eddie Ng as our honorary chancellor in the past years as well. Thank you, Mr. Eddie Ng, and please kindly share with us on your thoughts on um, the post-COVID-19 crisis management. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bonnie, and um, good morning, good evening to our friends on the line. And uh, also, happy birthday, uh, Bonnie. Thank you. Um, I would like to cover a few things. First of all, um, this, this uh, COVID-19 is a total surprise attack, but also the first serious warning, exposing a lot of our weaknesses that we were not aware of in the past normal days. Yes. That would be my first position. Therefore, good news are we know what our weaknesses right now, and we need to work on that. That's part of the rules. And also that would give some direction to the uh, CSR in the near future as uh, what to do to target and focus. The second point I would like to make, and that is the damages uh, has have already been uh, uh, taken place and uh, mainly all walks of life have been affected. All the basic rules, basic principles were being challenged. Normal school days, forget it. Mm. Health services, sometimes you need to be left in the cold of the hospital rooms. And I've seen there's still a guest games here and there. The level of uncertainty is beyond history. So what to do with that one? And uh, I agree with the previous speaker. Time for us to take both individual and community together as perspective, to harmonize both rather than challenging and be in contrast between the two. That is what we need to do right now because this virus is attacking the mankind 
whoever you are, wherever you are, whenever you are. So this is the one. And this is not post COVID-19. It's a third, first wave, second wave, third wave, and fourth wave. So from that perspective, let's be aware of the seriousness of it and the opportunities coming along. What to do with this one, I just call a couple of examples. Knowing a lot of the disadvantages, population and communities. China, as an example, continue focusing on elevation of poverty. Probably in the whole world history, first time you have seen the uh, last several years efforts, over 100 million people been off the poverty line. This is a fundamental one and actually good for the CSR, particularly the economic downturn, short term and long term. The second one is a lot of people off the street. Hong Kong alone have a double, has faced the double percentages of unemployment. This is a very serious one. However, this one company called New World uh, Corporation in Hong Kong, a very good uh, uh, big size uh, corporation, despite of a 30, 40% loss in profits and in businesses, they continue just uh, launching another recruitment drive for over 2,000 positions. May you be in different backgrounds, may you be a, a captain crew in the airline or in engineering field or in others, you are wanted, you are given an opportunity, not just to do a normal job, but be able to create new jobs to meet the new needs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the companies are going bankrupt and are more are going to come as the, uh, what we call the, uh, the Latin effect of the, uh, of the crisis. Therefore, time for us to think doing business in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of the um, investors are now taking a totally different perspective in uh, putting money where the opportunity is, not just opportunities, but also caring about what people would feel and respond emotionally. This is part of the spirit of the CSR. And other than that one, I would be able to suggest as well, now with all the rumors and everything here and there, the selfishness of behavior and so on, integrity and community spirit becoming two major virtue in life for us to pick up what to do with them. And uh, I have uh, two more minutes. The first one is, first thing first, let's make sure our school kids will be able to get their education and schooling and learning more in a normal way, in a new normal environment. I think we should be creative enough to continue that because the younger population has a lesser possibility and risk in the in front of the virus. So let's work along this particular line because they are the next generation and we need them to fix a lot of unknown problems. Health and safety definitely the top priority. And personal mental health, confidence and hope. These are the three things people are looking for, hungry for right now. Let's focus on that one. Everything has a new chapter, so don't just refer to the old books. That's what we would like to build in terms of the mindset in everyone's mind. Um, I have three F and three C's as a concluding uh, point. The three S is, let's not just be talking and challenging and be politicking. Let's focus, let's be fast, and let's be fresh. Fred, do not build another bureaucracy, go do it in the shortest way, fastest way, effective way. These are the three F. Focus, fast, and fret. The three C's, we must be continue, we have to refocus on caring, collaboration. No one single-handedly can handle the problem. So collaboration, and we all need the confidence these are the three things we need to reshape and rebuild. Mm. I, probably, I, I better stop here now using up my seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hardy. And yeah, thank you for your free C and free F uh, 
which is uh, very, very true to the current situation in the post-COVID world. And uh, surely the examples you have given us is very inspiring as well, especially for the new world, still hiring 2,000 positions. And I believe it's a challenge to many managerial uh, uh, positionings in, in different companies at the moment in the post-COVID world. So we are very honored to have a third speaker, Mr. Luigi Cabrini, uh, who is the chairman of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. Uh, in short form, it's called GSTC since 2014. So Mr. Cabrini, you have led several initiatives on sustainable tourism at a global level, focusing on tourism and climate change, tourism and biodiversity observatories um, for sustainability tourism, the green economy, and the tourism and heritage global partnership as well. You were the director of UNWTO World Tourism Organization in Sustainable Tourism Program before uh, joining GSTC. So as we know that tourism has always been a major economic driver and under the huge impact, global impact, I would say, of the pandemic that holds everyone up from traveling. It is heading towards a breakdown. How can we actually build back a stronger tourism with COVID-19 as we face a shift of manpower and resources? And how the current downturn in global travel can be used to develop new models and approaches for a much resilient and sustainable tourism recovery that supports our communities, that creates jobs that promotes culture and also protects heritage and its and is transmission as well. So, Mr. Luigi, thank you for sharing. I will look forward to your insightful comments on the questions. Thank you very much, Moni, and thank you again for inviting me at this panel. Uh, you know, before the COVID-19 pandemics, tourism represented 10% of global GDP, one every 11 jobs worldwide. In many developing countries, including small island states, tourism was the primary economic activity and it dealt the growth of many other sectors such as fisheries, agriculture, food industry, etc. In 2019, over 1,500 millions of international tourists crossed the border to visit another country. But in 2020, following the unprecedented health social and economic emergency caused by the COVID, tourists suffered the greatest crisis on record and retroceded back to the level of 1990. International tourist arrival plunged by 74% due to widespread travel restrictions and massive drop in demand. The collapse in international travel represents a loss of about 1.3 trillion more than 11 times the loss recorded during the 2009 economic crisis. So this is obviously causing huge economic and social problems all over the globe, with millions of jobs lost, often within the most vulnerable segments. Only twice before, in 2003 for the SARS epidemic and 2009 for the financial crisis, the number of international tourists did not increase from one year to the next, but the drop was less than 5% compared to more than 70% today. In the short term, the only way to avoid the collapse of the tourist sector is the injection of public funds. USA and European Union, for example, are distributing subsidies of billions of dollars or euros, some of which to avoid the bankrupt of small and middle enterprises linked to the tourism and travel sector. But then the sector will need to recover. And experts say that returning to pre-COVID levels may take at least three to four years. If there is a positive side to the high price imposed by the pandemics, this is the opportunity to do better when tourism will restart again. Mm -hmm. Government destinations, the tourism industry as a whole, and the travelers have to decide whether to return to the same model pre-COVID or take advantage of the reset to eliminate or at least to reduce the negative impacts caused by tourism. Local communities, big and small, will need to be empowered and better equipped in person the tourist model that better suits them. Both mature and emerging destinations need to be clear about their goals, define them, monitor their compliance, rather than aiming exclusively at a higher number of visitors. Mm. Definitely, we must not go back to the over-tourism. 
during the financial and economic crisis of 2009, there was also an expectation that the billions of dollars injected in the economy will lead to a transformation into more greens models. I coordinated a UN study on tourism and the green economy, and main conclusion was that with an investment of only 0-2% of global GDP, it would have been possible to drive an important shift toward renewable energy, reduction of CO2 emission, reduction of water consumption, but it did not happen, or only with moderate results. Let's therefore be very clear. The change will not happen on its own. Strong commitment and leadership from governments and from the big tourist players in the private sector will be more important than ever, as there will be a temptation to recover at any cost and to downplay sustainability as a lower priority. Our organization, the Global Sustainable Tourist Council, is committed and equipped to support this recovery. In this crisis, the set of global criteria or standards for sustainable destination and for the oil tourism industry that we developed since 2007 are proving to be a useful and relevant tool for public and private sector. It's interesting to note that we have more new members joining in 2020 than in previous years, and that the participation in our training courses online tripled in numbers. Our approach to sustainability is global, addressing all its aspects, environmental, social, economic, and cultural as a whole. Uh, while most of our members were at the beginning from the private sector, we've seen uh, increased interest from government. Ministries from Norway, Sweden, Portugal, Slovenia, Malta, Japan, etc. have joined GSDC. And this is a very promising development as public authorities see value in a framework that can inform the national strategies of sustainable tourism and provide tools to introduce and monitor management of destinations. The main issue for a real transformation of tourism industry will be substantially the same for the post-COVID recovery, but some of these will have more relevance. Is there a business case for sustainable tourism? Are big tourist players committed to seriously increase the level of sustainability in their operations? Are governments effectively supporting a transition to more sustainable models? Mm. There are many drivers for a change. Cost reduction, reducing energy consumption pays off in a short time, long-term visions as companies with a vision for the future want their business to continue and prosper and have to protect the environment on which it depends. Engaging staff in corporate social responsibility, the main task of your organization, Bonnie, is a key driver of employee satisfaction and boosts the commitment and the goals of the company. But most importantly, sustainable tourism responds better to emerging consumer trends and has a competitive advantage by offering differentiated experiences to travelers. In a post-pandemic tours, travelers will demand that destinations, hotels, transportation, attractions be safe and clean. There will be a higher request for slow and local travel. Domestic tourists are likely to be relevant than international tourists. The expectation of a tourism of a higher quality and to enjoy authentic travel experiences will be stronger than before. And finally, there is also pressure to the tourism industry of a more ethical behavior, of an increased responsibility to reduce emission, to protect biodiversity, to reduce the use of plastic that ends into the oceans, to prevent sexual exploitation of minors. Many travelers will choose their destinations or hotel, taking into account their commitment toward these issues. Mm. This trend, already present during the pandemic, will have a much stronger dimension. Definitely no one augurs a return to a lockdown, but we understood how damaging can be an unmanaged footprint from millions of tourists. I believe that I'm out with my time, so I finish here, Bonnie, and then if there is a few minutes later, I will have a, a couple of final comments. Thank you. Yes, definitely. So uh, we regret that our fourth speaker, Lucia Curtis, is actually encountering certain kind of technical issue, and I think uh, she is trying to resolve it still. And she's let's see if she is able to come back before the session ends. And so, so here we have a few attendees uh, joining in. Uh, maybe we could also invite them to give us certain kind of questions. Like if there's any questions, please feel free to 
type at a message box at the comment side of the, the at the bottom of the side you can ask the question and we will we will i will raise the questions to the panel speakers please feel free to ask questions hereby if anyone have any questions then we would um be delighted to go through and answer I know that Professor Fu is actually with us here today. <laughs> so, Professor Fu, um, if you are listening, then would you like to raise a few questions that we could actually address with us? So, Professor Fu is actually one of our executive chancellor. Uh, he's actually our executive chancellor, not our, one of our executive chancellors. So, let's see if we can have any other comments as well from other like from like such as Gary uh, Barker, uh, thank you for joining us and Susanna, Susanna Philander, who is also, I can see that you are also in responsibility, corporate responsibility director in Intel. Wow, welcome, welcome to our panel and see if anything we can actually address. We have just mentioned about um, sustainable tourism and how, what, what is important as a key drivers. We've also been mentioning about uh, education, the importance and like how what corporates has been playing important roles uh, in order to provide some more jobs to uh, and a shift of industry, uh, human resources as well. And we also had uh, Mr. Berlanga been addressing certain kind of uh, post-COVID-19 social corporate responsibility mindsets that is required. Um, so, uh, so as to see um, from individual to a community or even cross communities as a whole. So if there's any questions, please feel free to, to ask here and uh, we will try to bring it up. Uh, but uh, maybe meanwhile, among our speakers, let's see if we can also further discussion on the topic and if there's anything that you would like to further address, also please feel free to, to raise in this panel. Uh, we still have a little bit much time, like 10 minutes more, to, and see if Lucia can actually join back onto the panel. So anything you would like to further address, like uh, uh, Mr. Luigi, that you said that you, really, you would like to make a few more remarks on the sustainable tourism. Yes, say, thank you, Bonnie. Yes, in fact, you know, uh, at the time of the 2000 economic crisis, uh, we have seen that those travel companies that had integrated uh, sustainable business practices into their product and their services gained mm -hmm. a competitive advantage and were best placed for survival. So we have an example, even of a much smaller dimension, that investing in sustainability is it, it's, it's, it's a win-win uh, offer. And uh, uh, we have seen even now uh, in this year, since, you know, tourism is used so much, that those destinations, hotels and tour operators engaging in sustainable practices are resisting better than others because of the change in demand I was mentioning before. So uh, I think what is important now is uh, major commitment from government, investment from destinations, and as I, as I mentioned before, uh, there was a time where destinations were just planning for more tourists. I think that time is over. We have to plan for better tourists, if you want to say that way. We have to plan in a way that uh, the benefit is uh, uh, spread among all the local communities and the balance being done between uh, benefit and, and negative impact. Uh, we really, there was a trend in tourists that everyone said it was insustainable, a growth of 6-7% every year and numbers of millions increasing. And I think uh, we, if you want to go back to those numbers, we definitely need to improve the way we're doing tourism. Thank you. Yes. So we have a question arising here from one of our attendees, uh, Federico. Fafila from the CEO from NoviCap is asking our panelists like how do we see uh, collective capitalism accelerate post-COVID 
as in how do we see collective capitalism accelerate after COVID? For instance, she gave us an example like Black Rock putting pressure on their pharma investments to open source IP around COVID-19. So see if anyone would like to take this question on the on how black on the what is what do we have um perspective on collective capitalism to overcome the failings of traditional capitalism such as the Great Depression in the 1940s, for example, according to Wikipedia. <laughs> so, see. Money? Yes. May, may, may I, I want to make one, one comment? This is Gustavo. As, yeah. as I told you at the beginning of my presentation, uh, COVID has been a wake up call in, in many ways. And uh, an investment is just one of the main issues that can shift for the good from this business as usual in a sustainable way. As, uh, as um, if, if we think This short-term vision of, of profit against this long-term vision of profit, but also to transcend and to go beyond, that's the kind of investors that we need in the planet. We as human, we have been since the beginning, in 70,000 years ago, we started to control all the other species in the planet. That's no longer sustainable. We are now on a tipping point as humanity after thousands of years that it don't, it, it don't, it don't make that change. If we don't make that change and the private sector is one of the engines and, and, and the motors to make, to make that change, we are going to collapse on this decade in 2030. Uh, we, we, with all these uh, climate change and, and, and social crisis. So investment, we need the investors to, to think in a long-term vision, in a long-term way, and then to, to focus on how to uh, be on the, on the good for the next generations to come. Uh, that, that, those are my comments, and, and I leave the, the other panelists to, to share their own thoughts. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay. We also got another question from uh, Professor Franku on, on the question is about should providing employment uh, be a major priority for corporations? Because uh, just now we mentioned that maybe one of the big corporations in Hong Kong has been providing uh, 2,000 positions to uh, to the job market as a way to uh, contribute to the society as well as to uh, to to uh, make use of the new human resources, uh, the new workforce in uh, from different industry to uh, the current industry, and how can the Government, he, uh, Professor, to ask how can the government or the multi uh, national corporations contribute in this under pool? So we have five minutes left. So see if we can uh, quickly address this question and then we can wrap this session up. How can the government and the multinational corporations contribute to, to this under pool by providing an employment? As a major priority for the corporation. So, Mr. Eddy, thank you for addressing this question. You know, being an HR professional, I think I have, uh, I, I, I would like to respond to that. If you look at the different economies, actually, governments trying very hard to set aside, you know, uh, extra money and uh, in order to uh, provide to the community from all different corners. 
in order to upkeep a few things, basic living, employment, even short term. Taking example is a particular young people and uh, who are new or who are green in a job as uh, are the most vulnerable group for unemployment. Therefore, uh, Hong Kong government has an example. Uh, we put the money and uh, to cost subsidizing some of the jobs being provided by companies and the government itself uh, create certain temporary jobs as well so that people at a short-term basis, at a time tenure basis, would have uh, have, uh, would be a uh, uh, halfly gainfully employed is part of the employment. But there's another part of the employment is like the investment and also, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, both companies and the uh, investors allow, you know, a looking at uh, different areas so that an uh, opportunity to get new people, new mindset with new skills and now uh, a new aspiration to move into new services and new products. This is part of the creativity and innovation and also part of the way to build strategic talent and workforce during the in the midst of the crisis for tomorrow. Therefore, this uh, employment would have uh, two sides of it. One is of a basic living, uh, elevating the pain. The other is uh, strategically positioning for midterm and long term. And I believe it's not just multinational corporation, all corporations, and I should be able to kick in. I have seen quite a lot of the uh, small and medium sized companies and are also doing quite a lot of things in order to help out on this one. Col- uh, collaboration is the key. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for your questions. Uh, um, and also thank you very much, Mr. Belanga and Mr. Eddie for addressing the two questions that is uh, raised by the audiences today. And so as to conclude today's um, um, panel, I think that uh, we have to uh, really work on the free C's and free outs that we have mentioned. Free C's as in caring and collaboration and also having the confidence and hope again in the, for the future and also to have free F to stay focused, fast and flat, be effective in the things that we do. So so thank you very much everyone for joining us today. And it was a great regret that Lucia cannot join at the end, <laughs> even though we have practiced and you know to do the testing very much. So, and thank you very much. And uh, I wish you all uh, good health and uh, we shall see again in another time uh, after horaces. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye bye. Good morning. Good bye. evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ferenc. Yes, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.